We can be dream makers, nurturing, compassionate. Nosotros podemos ser más unidos. We can be anything. I'm Grant Oliphant. This is We Can Be. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. There is perhaps no sentence more important to the United States than that one. Those 45 words, as read here by today's guest, Max King, are the entirety of the First Amendment found in our Bill of Rights, and they have been a powerful cornerstone of our identity and of our democracy itself. Max today is president and CEO of the Pittsburgh Foundation. He is a nationally respected voice on First Amendment issues, which first drew his interest in the pre-social media days of the 1970s, when he was a reporter and eventually editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And in 2018, in partnership with the Heinz Endowments, Max has spearheaded the First Amendment for the 21st Century Conference. Max, thank you for coming in and doing this. My pleasure. Your career has come nearly full circle at this point. Well, except for an interesting merchant marine detour, <laughs> which we'll, we'll talk about. But you've gone from being a newspaper reporter to a foundation leader who I worked for, in fact. And then you've come back as a foundation leader in another incarnation to a focus on First Amendment issues. Uh, have you ever seen a time where it's more necessary to focus on these questions of the First Amendment and the importance of a free press? Well, I guess the time that comes to mind for me is back in the 70s during the Nixon administration. And there were a lot of tensions then, too, about how the structure of American society, the press, the courts, the rule of law, how they would hold up. So in a way, these times today are a little bit reminiscent of that with a special prosecutor and, and all of that. But I guess one of the differences that makes a big impression on me is the attitudes in the population in the United States. When I look back to that time, there wasn't a huge part of the population that seemed really hostile to the press. And today there is. And we have that going on all over the world. Countries in Europe, in Asia, Russia, China, South America. Well, good Lord, what's happening in Venezuela is, you know, we're just watching a society come apart. And then there are large other cohorts of our society today that just don't understand how the First Amendment works, what's important about it. They think you're talking about something that is important to the New York Times. It's not important to them personally in their lives. That's a difference that's troubling to me. He was putting out a statement saying that that was fake news, that it was just mentioned that way. And it's frankly disgusting the way the press is able to write whatever they want to write. And people should look into it. President Trump is engaged in the most direct, sustained assault on a free press in our history. But don't take it from me. Listen to Bill McRaven, a Navy SEAL for 37 years, who became the head of U.S. Special Forces, the man in charge of the mission that killed Osama bin Laden. On February 17th, the president said, the news media is the enemy of the American people. The news media is the enemy of the American people. This sentiment, this sentiment may be the greatest threat to democracy in my lifetime. This sentiment. You and I have agreed to collaborate on a conference, actually a pair of conferences, one of which will be national to focus attention on the dangers to the First Amendment that we face. Why is it important to American democracy to worry about that? And why is it important to a local community to worry about it? The rights, the freedoms we have in the United States are important to all of us, regardless of political persuasion. People way over on the right, way over on the left, share a passion for the freedoms that we enjoy, but they don't always understand how it works. And to me, the 
freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly is sort of the linchpin to all of the rest of our freedoms. And that's why I think the First Amendment, first of all, I think it's why it comes first, because the founding fathers understood it was the linchpin freedom. You know, Thomas Jefferson famously said, uh, if I had to choose between a free press and government, I'd choose a free press. It's more important. And secondly, I think the way it functions, if you, if you look at history, whenever a society is moving from a more democratic society to a more autocratic paradigm, the first thing that goes is freedom of speech, freedom of the press. It seems crucial that the public gain a better understanding of how those critical freedoms work. But I also think it's an important piece of work for foundations. It's important for us to recognize that these freedoms and how they're exercised is something that is not, it's not a national phenomenon. It's carried out locally. It's carried out community by community by community across the country. And so we should properly concern ourselves with how the understanding of it takes place in our community. And yet we live in a time when the things you're talking about, which might have seemed self-evident at one point, don't now. And I'm curious if you've encountered pushback as you've been talking with people, for example, about why the First Amendment is the linchpin freedom. Do you find people pushing back and saying, uh, it's only national policy, that's just political, it's not something a foundation should be getting into? Yeah, I, I haven't heard as much from people who say it's national, it's not an important issue for us. I haven't heard that much. But I have heard from people who say, oh, it's political, why, why don't you stay out of it? My answer has been, everything's political. <laughs> and pretty much everything that matters is political. I think we should try to steer away from any partisan politics, but to extend it to we stay out of all politics, it's just simply crazy because everything that's important is a political issue. An example, what was the big political issue in the United States in 1852? It was slavery. What was the big moral issue in 1852? It was slavery. Could you say that leaders, foundation leaders, other leaders should, should have said back then, well, it's a political issue. Let's let the Republicans and the, the Whigs and the whatever sort that out. No, nobody would suggest that. We have to be relentlessly careful to stay away from partisan politics, but that doesn't mean you stay away from politics. You stay away from tough issues, particularly if you think they're going to be important to your community. That's precisely right, and that's precisely the calculus I think many of us are going through today, which is that the moral issue outweighs the political concern. You and I wrote an op-ed together at one point in reaction to a local newspaper editorial that defended the president's use of the phrase asshole countries in describing countries in South America, Africa, and Haiti. We received blowback on that by people who thought that we were being political. You, you mentioned at the start of this conversation what you experienced coming into journalism in 1970. Was there some of that same messiness in 1970? It didn't have the intensity, confusion, and anxiety that attends today's circumstances, but there still were plenty of people who didn't understand or didn't support that sort of freedom of the press. I mean, my first newspaper job, it was a summer job when I was in college, it was back in 1965, and I was sent by the editor of the paper to cover the local school board. This was a, a small paper up in Vermont. And the school board did some routine business and then told me to leave, that, that I had to leave. And I said, well, I don't think so. I'm here to, to cover the school board meeting and whatever you do. I mean, and they said, no, 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 we're going into executive session. You have to leave now. And I said, well, why are you going into executive session? And the school board president said, well, that's my business. That's none of your business. So I slunk back to the newsroom, which was a couple blocks away, and I had a fierce editor of that paper, a man named Kendall Wild. And he beat me up and he said, you go back there right now, push in the door, sit down, tell them you have a right to be there. And unless they can explain why the executive session is on a matter that is protected by Vermont law, 
don't leave. And by the way, I'll be right along myself, the editor said. So I went back and I did push in. And the school board president said, well, we're calling the police to have you removed. And I said, well, you better hurry up because Kendall Wilde's on his way too. <laughs> and he came in and delivered a stirring lecture to the members of the school board and they let me stay. But I mean, those sorts of things have always happened, I think. But the mood is different now. It's such a hostile, divided populace electorate that every single thing that happens becomes a fierce matter of contention. And you know, I talk to people who think that's Donald Trump's fault. I don't think so at all. I see Donald Trump as less a cause than a symptom of kind of a, a, a growing anger and malaise. And I think he was a smart enough politician to figure out how to capitalize on it, but I don't think he caused it. And as long as 50 or 60 percent of the population questions at any given time whether they have a stake in society, we're going to have that unrest and dysfunction. Tonight, inside the Supreme Court, a rare and exclusive interview with the longest-serving justice, Antonin Scalia. Yeah, yeah if I were king, uh, I would not allow people to go about burning the American flag. However, we have a First Amendment, which says that the right of free speech shall not be abridged. And it is addressed, in particular, to speech critical of the government. I mean, that was the main kind of speech that tyrants would seek to suppress. The president-elect tweeted, quote, nobody should be allowed to burn the American flag. If they do, there must be consequences, perhaps loss of citizenship or a year in jail. A year in jail, exclamation point, end quote. You know, you're the head of a community foundation. You used to head a regional private foundation, the one that I now had. You were head of a community newspaper. Arguably, your career has been about community, and yet the trends you just described are trends that tear away at community. And clearly now we have a school of thought that in the internet age, community doesn't really matter. Is at some level the dynamic we're seeing a reassertion of the importance of community? Absolutely, absolutely right. The theory in the 1990s when the internet was first getting widespread use was this will destroy the concept of place because it doesn't matter where you are. You can be wherever you want to be. In fact, the opposite has happened. Place matters more than ever. One of the things that I love about Pittsburgh, one of the things that drew me back to Pittsburgh after I, I left is it's, it is of all the cities that I'm familiar with in the United States, the one with the strongest sense of place. There really is a sense of community here. And I think one of the responsibilities of all of these foundations is to figure out what do we do to support the idea of community and to get people to understand that the individual freedoms they have are dependent in a very significant degree to their sustaining the idea of community. You're a giant of the journalism field, uh, and it's important. Grant, I'm that, just old. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but when you talk to people in the profession about the heyday of the profession, Max King's name matters. And oh, thank you. you know, I want to um, take a moment to reflect on how you became you. You certainly came from a family that had a distinguished past. Your grandfather had been Ernest Hemingway's editor, and you chose in your teens to just take off in, on a path that took you around the world. I was a freshman in college, and at the end of your freshman year, you have to declare a major. And I declared government as my major because my mother was very anxious for me to be a lawyer. She wanted me to go into politics. And then that summer, I thought, gosh, I think I'd rather kill myself than go to <laughs> law school. <laughs> I don't want to do that, Mom. But instead of just changing Good my choice. <laughs> instead of just changing my major, I came up with a much better solution, which was to quit college. I went got a, a job on the ore boats on the Great Lakes, and then I went to New York and, and got a couple ships that went to Europe and Africa and Asia. So I really did get to travel all around the world. During the course of that year, I learned a great deal. 
had to learn how to fight, among other things. You can't be in the merchant oh, marine. Oh, I was about to ask you, <laughs> what did that teach you that you couldn't have learned at Harvard? Yeah, uh, I wouldn't have learned how, how to protect myself when somebody came after me with a broken bottle, <laughs> which you do learn in the merchant <laughs> marine. But the other thing I learned was, gee, I don't want to work this hard the rest of my <laughs> life. I want to go back to college. And when I went back, I decided that what I wanted to do was become a writer, which, of course, was the influence from my grandfather. So I did. I came out of college and became a writer on a newspaper. And then you went into journalism. And was the decision to go into journalism just the fastest route to being a writer? Or was there, there some special appeal about journalism at the time? Well, by the time I came out of college, I was married. Within less than a year, Peggy, my, my wife and I had a baby. So if I wanted to be a writer, I had to figure out how to get paid as a writer. And the newspaper seemed the best way to, to do that. And it was a great way. And, and, you know, I worked for the Providence Journal, the Louisville Courier Journal, and then the Philadelphia Inquirer. You described beautifully, I thought, a story about the beginning of your career where you were kicked out of a school board meeting and had to make a personal choice that was aided by your editor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was there another incident in your life where you faced a moral dilemma and you really had to make a choice about – fulfilling your responsibilities as a journalist and as a moral human being versus doing what was comfortable for you? Well, I'll go back to a time at the Philadelphia Inquirer. We had a, a big story that was in question about whether we were going to publish it or not. At that time, we had, I think, no fewer than four active lawsuits against the company that owned the Inquirer from Supreme Court justices in Pennsylvania. But one of the things we believed at the Inquirer was that they were trying to chill the Inquirer's coverage of the court, which was, there's a lot of controversial stuff that was happening back then in the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania. We covered it very aggressively. One of my best reporters did a long story for the Sunday paper on the status of the court, what cases were coming forward, how each justice was likely to see them what the history of the justices was, and it accounted also for the lawsuits against us and other newspapers. And I took it to our general counsel because if it was going to be something highly controversial, I let the general counsel know about it. And she was uncomfortable with it and took it to the publisher, and he was uncomfortable with it. And they said they just felt for us with four active lawsuits to do a, a, what we called a takeout, which is a long Sunday story on the courts was provocative and was needless. My position was, this is what we do. This is what the Philadelphia Inquirer does. It explains things to our readers. If we stop doing it in this sector of government because of a lawsuit, they win. They have chilled us. And I didn't convince the general counsel and the publisher. And so they bounced it to corporate headquarters. And the vice president for news there bounced it to the CEO of the corporation, Tony Ritter, who happened to be somebody I knew pretty well and respected, and he respected me. So I got the call from Tony Ritter at home, and he said, Max, I think you know where I'm calling. And I said, well, Tony, have you read the story? He said, no, I haven't read the story, and I'm not going to, Max. You're my editor. You tell me it should be done? Is that what you believe? And I said, yeah, that's good enough. He said, publish. Wow. And boy, wow. did that make a difference for me. <laughs> Yeah. And, the rem and the repercussions were? Well, I wasn't too popular with a publisher. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Is there a lesson in that for philanthropy? You know, foundations are not famous for that sort of courage and for standing up in the face of that sort of withering attack. It's one of those age-old life lessons, which it often comes down to one strong person doing the right thing, having a voice saying something. And I don't mean me, I mean Tony Ritter, yeah. you know, who, who understands not just the question at hand, but the principles and values behind that question, and will stand up for it. What was the appeal for you to go from journalism to philanthropy? Well, you touched on a little bit earlier, Grant, when you mentioned the fact that most of my career has been about community. Mm. And when you're in journalism at a newspaper, you care a lot about the community. You're focused on the community. You're trying to figure out what's going on, what does the community need. But you're an independent observer. You're not a player. You, you have to keep a distance 
uh, you're supposed to be neutral. And I was in my mid-50s, and I was kind of tired of being neutral. <laughs> I wanted to have a job in which I could really be an activist and be an advocate for the community and try to work really hard to provide things for the community. I didn't know that that community might be Pittsburgh until the headhunter for the Heinz Endowments approached me. And by the way, that was 1999. Things weren't looking up then. They were looking down. It wasn't a great time. No, but, but the potential of the community, actually coming from out of town, you could probably see it better than someone who'd been here for 20 years and gone through the terrible disruption of the steel mills closing and all that. But when I came in, it just seemed like a place with incredible potential. Boy, was I lucky to get a job like that in this town. So you arrived in Pittsburgh in your new job as a guy clearly on a mission. You have a powerful personality and a powerful way of communicating about what you think. How did you apply what you learned in journalism to the world of philanthropy? Well, what I learned as a reporter and a writer was the writing isn't going to be any good if the reporting isn't good. So what I really learned that what it was of value is how to relate to people, how to talk to people, how to get them to tell you their story, how to be empathetic, and how to be fair to them so that they'll tell you their next story. Mm -hmm. I thought when I took the job at the Heinz Endowments, well, I've had 20 years of experience as a manager because I'd been city editor and I'd been vice president of the corporation for a while before I became editor. So I'd been a manager for 20 years and I thought, well, all that managerial experience will really help me at the Heinz Endowments. But what was really interesting to me is that what mattered was my reporting experience. Being able to talk to people, to relate to them, to understand their situation, to gather a lot of information, to begin to kind of understand what the problem was, what mm -hmm. some possible solutions might be, then to talk to people in a way uh, that was genuine about what might happen. That's all the work of philanthropy. Mm. Whatever skills I had, had derived from my time as a reporter, more than a manager, I think. And then let me ask the question in reverse. How has your experience in philanthropy informed your thinking about the First Amendment as we enter this period or find ourselves in this period where it's embattled? You know, I used to think about the First Amendment when I was a newspaper reporter and an editor as just that shield that protected us mm -hmm. to go anywhere we wanted to and get what information we needed. I don't think I really thought about it as much in the context of the community. Now what I see as the essential community need, and, and it's, it's a need that's not being met in almost any community in America today, is for there to be a really strong civic discourse about things that matter. But the problem is things are so balkanized in terms of interests that we don't have the kind of civil discourse that I think we need. So I look at the First Amendment now and the work I'm doing now a little bit less as about the press and more about our rights to, to get information as a community, our rights to protest, to process that information, to advance ideas. And what scares me is if there are successful constraints put on the press, I think we're next after that. Yeah. When you say we're next, you're thinking philanthropy or you're thinking no, the I'm civil thinking society? Civil or? society, yeah. Interesting. Last season, of course, hundreds of players knelt during the anthem to protest racial injustice and police brutality. I was down at the 9-11 memorial yesterday. Is it not about the First yesterday. Amendment? Is it not about their First Amendment rights? No, it's not. They, they have the right to have their First Amendment off the field. Now the new policy says players must stand or stay in the locker room. President Trump applauded the policy in an interview on Fox. Well, I think it's good. You have to stand proudly for the national anthem. Well, you shouldn't be playing. You shouldn't be there. Maybe you shouldn't be in the country. And the NFL owners did the right thing if that's what they've done. To some extent, we take a lot of those freedoms for granted. If you go back to the First World War in the administration of Woodrow Wilson, Wilson used the excuse of the First World War, and I use that word advisedly. He used the excuse of the First World War mm. to just shut down freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. Literally, the federal government 
had agencies that had offices and communities around the country and were providing support for and payment to citizens who would report to the government on what other citizens were saying that weren't patriotic. And by the way, it didn't stop with the end of the First World War. It was a long time before we recovered from that. Do you think we're more willing to trade away our freedoms today? That's my big fear. Mm -hmm. There's so much of our society that questions whether they have a stake in it that they are definitely willing to trade things away. Here's a statistic I still find shocking. I learned it about a year ago. 58% of the families in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, have no savings. They're living paycheck to paycheck. That means one bad thing, a fire in the house, a health care crisis, the car has crashed, can tip them into destitution. And they can lose their home. They can lose their work. You can't have almost 60% of the people in your society that at risk and have stability. And we don't have stability around our freedoms or, or our communities. Obviously, the First Amendment, all of the freedoms encompassed in it can't be alone the antidote for it, but they're important. They help us understand it. They help us protest against it. They help us speak up about it. Focusing on the journalism piece for a moment, some have said that despite the decline in journalism as a business, in some ways we're living in a golden age of journalism because of the extraordinary investigative reporting particularly focused on Washington being done through the New York Times and the Washington Post and other sources. Do you think that's true and does it tell the whole story? It's true in, a, in, the, in the sense that a number of news organizations have really risen to the challenge of digging in and covering government, covering the administration in Washington with great intensity. But that's happening in Washington. Journalism is weak in state capitals all across the country. Journalism is weak in communities uh, around the country. I was at a conference a few weeks ago that focused on democracy at the Kettering Foundation in Ohio. And Alberto Ibarguen, who runs the Knight Foundation, said something really smart, I thought, because Alberto came out of the newspaper business too. We had some of the same experiences in journalism. And Alberto said, we're in a valley between two different paradigms the old paradigm of robust newspapers making pots of money and doing a lot of journalism and television and radio being very robust. And then some new paradigm in 10 or 20 years when a new economic construct will emerge that supports really good journalism. But while we're in the valley, the good journalism isn't being supported by the revenue that we would hope. And so his argument was that this is a time when foundations all across the country, and individuals, he said, should support good journalism. Alberto's right, the model's kind of broken. And certainly he's right about the old paradigm in the valley. The question that you and I wring our hands about is, is he right about the next paradigm and can it hurry up? <laughs> right. And I think part of what we struggle with is how to help accelerate the arrival of that new paradigm. And as you think about the sweep of your career, journalism, philanthropy, focused on community, focused on social issues. What is it right now that just animates you to want to care about what's happening in our country? What is it that, that drives you and fuels you to that sort of courage? I love to read current affairs, newspapers. I love to read history, and I read a lot of history. I like to read publications that bring me news of other countries around the world. And as tough as it can sometimes seem in America, one thing is absolutely crystal clear to me, and that is this is so much a better construct than almost any place in the world in terms of how we put together the construct 200 years ago and how we live up to it today. This is a big, beautiful thing that we've inherited in our generation. And God help us, we better pass it along in at least as good shape as we got it. Is it fair to say that your charge to every one of us is to be that strong voice who stands up for that vision? Yes, and not to all agree, but just to be able to express in a way that is strong 
and principled, but not combative, what you believe in. Max is 100% correct when he says that it often comes down to one person having a strong voice to be willing to make the difference. We have to protect the right of people to exercise that voice, to become that voice, to organize, to assemble, to protest, to, as the amendment says, petition. Max very humbly says that he was not that voice in the story he told us, but time and again it is clear that people like him have been that voice and people like us must be it now. If we can each do this, we as individuals and as a nation can fully become all that our forefathers dreamt we could be when they wrote those 45 words 227 years ago. Mm -hmm.